You're listening to the Finding Careers End podcast. I'm your host, Pete Newsom, and my guest today is Brian Shields, meteorologist with WFTV in Orlando. Brian, welcome. How are you today? Thank you. I am good. My voice is a little hoarse. I'm sorry about that, but I am so excited to be here. Thank you for uh, having me on. I appreciate it. Well, it's extremely generous of you to join. I, I, I really do appreciate it, especially because this is something you actually get paid to do is to be on camera and share your, your personality and your, your knowledge. So um, this is a real gift. So thank you. Yeah, I try not to share too much personality because nobody wants that, though. So that's, uh, you know, I do what I can. I do what I can. No, it's great to be here. Well, I want to I want to explore that a little bit because uh, you you know your position is unique in a number of different ways. Your um, you know, your your job has you known in the community. You're a celebrity um, for everyone in your in your area who views you, and you have to be on camera, which is an entirely you know different thing than ninety nine point nine percent of us ever have to do. And mm-hmm. so um, you don't you don't ever get to have a bad day, do you? It's, it's just, you know, it, it's, I have a lot of bad days for the record first, for starters, I have a lot of bad days, but yeah, I mean, it's, when you think about it, it's in a way, nonstop presentations, you're given a presentation and it's, it's a lot of them on, on TV, roughly 25 to 30 times every morning live. So um, it's just, but it gives me an opportunity to connect with people. And then it gives me an opportunity to make mistakes and adjust. You got to go with the flow. Sometimes mistakes happen. So that's part of the game. Yeah, and and I guess when you're live versus scripted and and you know recorded, um, you just have to go with it, right? I mean, I, obviously it takes a lot of training and getting used to, mm-hmm. but um, at this point, it probably is second nature, isn't it? Yeah, and fortunately, I I do the weather, so fortunately, my stuff is not scripted, which helps me because um, I'm used to kind of going with the flow, seeing what my graphics are. If things change, I just roll with it. I, it's a little bit tougher for the anchors that have have a script. Because, you know, with anything, if you're reading something, no matter how talented you are and something throws you off, uh, there's a messed up word or whatever, you know, that could really derail things. So, um, but it's all, it's all part of it. It's all part of it, but it makes it fun. I love, I love the live elements of it because um, things do happen and that keeps you on your toes. So I read your bio and and I think I shared with you uh, prior to us recording that, uh, I wasn't going to try to read it for that very reason because it sounds bad. I mean, I, I at least it, I'm not made to read on air. That's for sure. It's much easier to have a conversation. But in your bio, I believe you claim that you had you started doing weather forecasts when you were five years old. Is that true? I did. Yeah, I used to do these little forecasts for um, a few of our the houses like we lived on, like if it was raining. And I thought some areas would have puddles. I considered that flooding. So I had, I think it was, uh, it was a little chalk, chalkboard at the time. So in front of the TV, which was one of those console TVs, I have a little chalkboard at the time. So the old school, well, I don't even know if the Weather Channel was around at that point, but um, I'd have, you know, I'd draw my own little map of our neighborhood and in, in where there might be flooding. So yeah, so I was doing it. And then uh, when we were able to get, um, some sort of like video recorder. I can't remember. I guess it was just some type of camcorder. My friend and I, and I'd always drag him into it to do like a little newscast and stuff. So uh, he wanted no part of it, but we were good friends. So he did it with me. So yes, it's fun. I loved weather. I always liked it. I just, I think, I mean, you know, with weather, it, um, it controls a lot. It changes everything. You get a hurricane, everything changes, you know, things stop, things close, you have to prepare. So just that element and weather, while I don't wish a storm on anyone, a storm itself is, I mean, they're incredible um, beast and, you know, all sorts of weather. It's just, nature itself is just amazing. So I always wanted to do it. Well, it, it, as, as a viewer, it, it, you know, I've laughed at times where when when a hurricane's coming in Florida, which is a, you know, a devastating thing, right? Not not to make light of, of the destruction yeah, yeah. and the harm that it does. But, um, you know, the guys in your position seem to... Um, you know, appear to have a little more pep in their step, right? A little more enthusiasm yeah. when, when that happens, because that's your, that's your time to shine, right? Yeah, I mean, that's just, it's just, that's the thing is because then you get these comments like, do you wish a storm on someone? Do you want a storm to come? And the answer to that is no, but at the same time, you know, we see these things coming even before we're really going on TV, you know, announcing it 10 days out, we may see it. And it's, it's yeah, you, you, the energy level goes up, and it is. It's it's the Super Bowl for what what we do. So that's just um, yeah, it's what we do. So we don't wish the storm on anyone, but I mean, the power of a storm is awesome. You know, tracking the storms. That part of tracking it can be fun. I mean, in in certain parts of having a hurricane, 
you know, everyone gets together as a community, help each other out. So we're not making light of it, it's a devastating situation, but um, there's a big energy around as a whole and yeah, we're part of it. Yeah, I mean, it's undeniable. And, um, and I think that's when you guys are, you know, everyone looks to you being in Central Florida or being in Florida, I should say, that that is yeah, probably your your moment or that season where um, you know, it, everyone's lives are impacted in, in a significant way. Do you feel pressure in those situations? Yeah, I do. I feel a lot of pressure in those because it is tough to, I think the pressure I feel though is the communication part of it because I look to see, I, I know the bad communication out there where there's there's a hype with the storm Everybody thinks one storm is going to hit everywhere and it's not. So I feel the pressure to fight against kind of the uh, the bad information out there. So that's where I feel the pressure. And then I feel the pressure, I guess, maybe as a dad that I know, I think of other people's situations. It's easy for me to say, hey, it's going to be windy. You know, there's going to be devastation. But I'm thinking of when the storm comes, you're in the house with your family or a lot of folks are alone. And uh, a lot of people have different medical needs. Um, so I, you know, I feel the pressure to communicate one-on-one -on -one to those people. So, you know, we have a gazillion people watching them, but that's when I even try to be more one-on-one -on -one and very specific and deliberate with what I say, uh, because it, it is so important in those times. How much subjectivity comes into play with that or how much opinion or, or, um, you know, going with your gut, if you will, mm -hmm. right? You're a meteorologist. With, now, is it, it does that make you a scientist uh, as well? Is that was is that is that considered a science? Yeah, it, fa it falls. Yeah, it falls under that. So, um, uh, you know, the the hurricane forecasting itself is really good now. So, as far as going with um, our gut, um, the track forecasts are really really good. So, four days out, we're going to have a good idea if we're going to get a storm at least nearby. But tracks are very locked in. The bigger issue is the intensity, um, knowing the intensity of the storm. So sometimes we just got to go with our gut, you know, have uh, it, within 12 hours, the storm could go from 80 miles per hour to 120 miles per hour, maybe not, not 12 hours there, but, you know, very quickly. So with that, we have to kind of, it, it's a feel. How has the season been going? Have storms been blowing up quickly? So um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a science and, you know, we, we do the best we can. These things are beasts. How, um, uh, when you decided to become a meteorologist, what you, you, so you were inclined to do it from when you were young. So I'll just go, I want to go back a little bit, cause I could just ask you questions <laughs> for the entire time about you, know, you as a, a on-air personality and, and how, how that, um, you know, the, how, how that, uh, kind of guides so many things in your life outside of work too. So I, I want to get there, but just for. Uh, for anyone who is interested in in the career path of of um, of you know, that you've gone down, it, how did that evolve? It, did you yep. so you majored in uh, your meteorology major? Is that how it, it started? Yeah. So so going back uh, when I was five, we did have we had a hurricane at our home, and I remember my my parents moving the kitchen table out of the kitchen because it was kind of darker in there, and moving it into the family room. Uh, because we had more windows so that after, you know, the power went out. So the next, and it was out for like a week, you know, we'd have more light and just, just those things as a little kid were so influent, like everything changed. Schools were closed, businesses were closed. We had trees down everywhere. So I, it was such an impact uh, for me as a kid. And then, uh, so I had that love of weather and back then you had only a, you know, you didn't have a million TV stations. You only had a few. So if, if you liked weather, in my mind, you become a weatherman. That, that was it. So now these days you have a million different weather jobs. It's a booming business. Um, every airline, every cruise line, uh, every delivery uh, service from, you know, local ones just, you know, to, to UPS and whatever, they have meteorologists on staff because if they could re re reroute around a storm way ahead of time, they save millions of dollars. Um, so now it's a booming business military, all that stuff. And I, I didn't know that as a kid and they didn't have all that as a kid. So that's how I kind of got into the, the TV weather route. I just thought that was the only thing to do. So while I love being on TV, it is more about the, the weather for me. That was just an avenue.
I don't even know if I answered the question. You right. did, and and it's something that I hadn't thought of, um, and I think probably a lot of people haven't had thought of either. Which is, I do also associate. Well, if you're a meteorologist, you do it on TV, and and that's mm-hmm. that's the function, and the role. But what you just described makes perfect sense. That you know, there are so many businesses, so many um, different situations where you have to know what's coming uh, to make business decisions, like you said, that are gonna you know, be, have huge financial impact. Um, which so that didn't that there weren't a lot of those opportunities back when uh, you, you keep uh, you know, implying that you're older than you are I think <laughs> <laughs> no there weren't there weren't back in and, the old days and there weren't a lot of schools either that have had the major of meteorology so I actually went to Villanova as a geography major because they there's a professor there that loved uh, climate studies and he knew. I wanted to, you know, be a meteorologist. And I was like, okay, I'll go to grad school for meteorology. Um, he was a terrific guy, still a teach professor up there at Villanova. Um, so I, so yeah, so there's not a lot of meteorology schools. Um, but then I ended up getting a, a foot in the door through an internship I had my junior year in college. And I ended up on TV at the end of my junior year in college. I was in school in Philadelphia and I ended up in a small market, Salisbury, Maryland. So on Friday nights, time or for late Friday, I would go to class Friday morning, college of my senior year. I would leave uh, around 11 in the morning, drive two and a half hours to Salisbury, Maryland, go to Wawa. I would get a sub. I would get, uh, you know, a drink. And then I would go into the TV station and they had me do the, um, the newscasts on Friday night, Saturday night and Sunday night. And then Sunday night at 1130. I would drive two and a half hours back to Villanova in the middle of the night, and then I'd be back at an eight o'clock class on Monday morning. That's how I spent my senior year. Most people got to drink beer. I was doing that. So that was my- So they put you on air as a 21-year-old. Yeah. They were so, here's the thing. They were so desperate and I knew it. So I, (laughs) during my internship at Fox Philadelphia, uh, there was a prior intern who was filling in down at this TV station, and he just stopped into the TV station to say hello. And he's like, yeah, they can't get somebody to hold down this job because they're very low paying jobs. That's another another thing about our our field that people don't know, especially the smaller markets. I mean, just very I would punch in and punch out with a with a clock card or a time card. Um, And so they were desperate. So I didn't even have usually you had, uh, you know, some sort of videotape or something like that. I I didn't even have that ready because I was I never practiced on air stuff yet. I was just learning the weather part of it. But I, I. email them or call, I think I called them and I said, look, just give me a shot. I'll I'll drive down and just give me an audition. And I drove down and I think they were happy because I drove down. It doesn't cost them a dime. I gave them an audition. It was terrible, absolutely horrific. (laughs) And the chief meteorologist at the time, who is a great person, did not care whatsoever. She just cared that a human being was going to work the weekend so I wouldn't have to work. So she wouldn't have to work the weekend, which I get because she was working like crazy. She's like, great. Next weekend, can you start? I'm like, I'm in school. And she's like, we'll figure it out. So we'll, we'll get it. We'll, you know, we'll help you out in any way we can. We just want you on TV. And it was a um, colossal disaster. I was terrible. Terrible. Are, are there, are there do you have those recordings? There's, they one, there's one, there's one recording of my first one. It is so bad that I can't even go back and look at it. People are like, oh, it's not that bad. People are like, it's not that bad. And, or, you know, they, they assume it's not that bad. It is the, and maybe I'll show it to you sometime. Yeah, I was going to ask. You know I'm asking. I want to see it. worst thing ever. Like, if it was out there, I mean, maybe I'll put it out there because I, I really have no shame and I really don't care. But it would, you know, it would be something that would have gone viral at the time. It was a disaster. <laughs> so, and then as I go on my rant, I had no place to stay. I didn't have a place to stay. So, um, first weekend I was at some hotel, but it was, and I didn't know it sounded nice. It went out of business shortly after it was, um, let's just say it wasn't clean. And I kid you not, there was, there was drug paraphernalia in there. It was one of those hotels that maybe you just stay out for a couple hours and not the whole night. Written by the hour. Okay. So, uh, I didn't know that. Um, I didn't know the area at all. And I'm just a college student. It was a cheaper hotel. Uh, but one reporter let me use his apartment on the weekends, um, but he barely had any uh, furniture in there. So I was staying on a, a blow-up mattress. And I remember my first weekend there, I woke up and there were just cockroaches everywhere, just everywhere. It was, I were living on pennies, working on pennies, whatever. 
And the next day I went, I don't know, I don't even know, I think it was a Home Depot or something like that, and just was spraying his whole place, getting stuff because it was it was disgusting. But that's that's sometimes I once you get you got to get the foot in the door. Once you get the foot in the door, that was that was the most important thing. And I was doing what I love to do, but it was an interesting ride. So that's that's the question I was gonna ask you. You look back now and it's and it's a funny story to to, to and, and it's an impressive one that you were willing to do that. Um you created your own luck, so to speak. But were you happy at the moment? Were you thinking, "What am I doing here?" Or were you thinking, "Man, I'm living out my dream"? Yeah, no, I, I was. I couldn't have been happier um, because at that point too, because I still have a lot of people that are like, "You worked in, you did that in college. You lost your whole senior year." But you know, by the time you get to your senior year in college, usually you have your core group of friends. Actually, my girlfriend at the time was my current wife, so it wasn't like. I needed to go out to meet people, you know, like, you know, and you still hung out during the week. Um, so I didn't, I didn't feel like I missed much. Um, and, you know, my friends were very supportive, but it, it was, it was a wild ride. And looking back, um, I think, I mean, for me, that was, I will never forget that. It's, you know, it's not everyone ha has to pay their dues, but it was quite the learning process for me as a whole. I had a lot of support from, you know, my parents and stuff, but it was, yeah, you're sitting on a blow-up mattress, you're driving down in the middle of the night, you're going back and forth, um, but you do what you got to do to get the foot in the door. Getting a TV job was incredibly hard back then, and it still is, uh, it still is today. Well, I, um, so I started doing this podcast just about two months ago, and it was in, it's in support of Zengig.com, which is a new a website that we just published. So I, I think you know this. I've been mm -hmm. um, a staffing business owner for almost two decades. And after thinking about it for a long time, I decided to uh, create a new brand that would exist to just provide career advice and guidance. And one of the things that I'm trying to do on the podcast is bring on guests who have to tell their story of success. What What is their career path? And, and try to find unique positions um, and roles that people are in along the way. And Every story so far, I think this is probably the 10th um, show that I've done, there's a similar um, you know, scenario where it, it was taking a chance. It was starting from the bottom. It was not glorious in any way, but it was a necessary step to ultimately get um, you know, farther down the path. And so when people see you today, they think, wow, that's, that's, a, that's the job that I want to be in. Right. And part of this is really intended to be a message for younger people to listen and say, well, how do I get there? Well, it, it, the, the common theme so far with this podcast seems to be it takes work, it takes dedication and commitment, time. And time's probably the biggest mm -hmm. hurdle for young people today because you can't shortcut what you did. You have to, you had to go do that, right? And it wasn't easy and it wasn't handed to you. Um, what advice would you have right now for people, you know, who, because it is, it has to be incredibly hard. The, the jobs are few and far between, especially in, in, in good markets. Um, what, what advice do you have uh, for those who aspire to be in a role like yours? I think uh, like you were saying, you have to make your own, um, not make your own luck, but help create your own opportunities and be willing to go the extra mile. Even my second job um, that I got coming out of Salisbury was a station in West Virginia. And I remember calling or the news director there, the boss there called me. He's like, yeah, I saw your stuff. I like your stuff. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we want to get you out here in Charleston, West Virginia, which was 10 hours away or so. Um, and I said, I said, awesome. I will drive out there. And he's like, excuse me. I was like, I'll, I'll drive. I go, do you want me there tomorrow? I will drive out there. He goes, Brian, we could, we could fly you out here. We're going to fly you out here. And, but just that, because I had that first initial experience of, Hey, how can I, you know, you know, you don't want to look too eager or anything, but that's why I was like, I will drive out. Does that help you? I will gladly do that. I want this job. Um, I think that's that right there before I even got there kind of sealed the deal. And it wasn't anything, I wasn't trying to be cute or anything about it, but um, you know, you try to make the best of the opportunities. I also think it, you know, it helps to be, this will sound very cliche, but, you know, to be a good person, to be uh, truthful, to be in uh, never, and just not, I think along my career path is not make excuses. I think for, um, for things that go wrong, own up to your mistakes. That's huge. Now I'm getting, it's a little bit of a tangent, but just I'm going back on kind of a question you said was, Yes, you need to create your own opportunities, do the best you can interview process. But 
I think as an employee, you know, sometimes in, in the workplace over the, you know, decades that I've worked, it's always, well, that person always complains or they, you know, they, there's always an excuse for anything that goes wrong. It's, I had one of the toughest bosses, the toughest boss I ever had when I first came to Florida and, you know, owning a couple mistakes, because they were my mistakes. It's not, I'm not owning something I didn't do, but I, you know, I messed up a few times, like that, that's a hundred percent me. And for whatever reason, he's like, okay. And we just moved on. So um, it's you know, just being genuine, truthful, and and that's kind of that's kind of it. It's so big. Uh, you mentioned things that that I think of often in terms of you know, how does success happen? How does one become successful? How does one person become more successful than another? And and you mentioned what I would describe as enthusiasm that that willingness to I'll drive ten hours if that's what I need to do. I mean, what employer prospective employer doesn't want to hear that, right? A- everyone would, and and you know. It, it's a given. And then, um, you know, to be accountable is equally big and everyone makes mistakes. It's going to happen, but um, you have to be show vulnerability and you have to show that, Hey, I, I own it. And that's who I'm going to trust, right? I'm not going to trust the person as an employer who, who doesn't, um, who doesn't own up to those things because then I don't know what to believe. And so, mm-hmm. um, do you think those things were just kind of inherent? Did someone teach you to behave that way? Is just who you are? Do you, do you have any sense for where it came from? Um, those are amazing I, traits. They're, they're cool. yeah, I mean, that, that's a, you know, that's a good question. Um, I would, I would definitely say my parents, I mean, my, they, they worked, they worked hard for what they, you know, what they got. My dad didn't come from a whole lot. You know, he worked, he, but I think it was, he would work really long days and he always talks to me about the, these days now, how much travel he did back then. And I'm like, I don't remember you doing any travel. All I remember is you coaching my, my basketball games as a little kid. And it's funny. Those, those are the memories. And, you know, because he, you know, you put in the time at work, you put in the time at home, you just gotta, you just gotta do it. So I think, I think it was from him. The work ethic was most, you know, most likely from him. If you want something, you have to work for it, for it. And you have to, you have to go after it. I have to ask this because you're a father of three three sons. Oldest is starting high school. I know that because that's how you and I met <laughs> through 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 those boys. My youngest is starting high school, and I I think about those things constantly. Is how are they going to remember me as as a father? Are they going? What lessons am I teaching them through my actions, through my words, through my behavior? Mm-hmm. Do you do you think about that a lot now? When when you think, well, this I- is. I do. From your dad, how do you how do you pass that forward? I do. I wonder because I know I know you're a very involved dad, and I'm a very involved dad, and so in my mind, I'm like, oh, they'll remember me as you know a coach or whatever. But you know, it's probably going to be something that I don't quite think it is. But you know, I think the main thing though is you know, is to be around and be and be available best you can, and that's not easy for all dads or moms. Uh, because, you know, sometimes one is taken on the burden of work uh, if you're a single parent. So I understand that. But I think that the time you can give, if it's quality time, that's that's the most important thing. So even if you can't give a ton of time, it's the quality time. So I do think about what they may uh, think of me. So uh, but I, I'm, I'm not sure it'll probably be something totally different. So I hope it's OK. I hope it's not too stupid. Yeah, well, I don't think I think I, I, I the one thing I believe yeah there's a lot of things i don't know it's like the jury's still out right for, yeah <laughs> for both of us be honest, yeah. i will tell when <laughs> they're is. you know our age but um the uh i think they they see the actions right the actions and behavior it resonates much more than than the words if they if those things aren't consistent yes. then, then the words are meaningless right? right so i i mean i know for you you're present, you show up you 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 deliver you know on your duties as a father consistently and that's that's probably the most important thing. At least that's that's my per, you know take. I on. think you uh, hit the nail on the head there, and I think that's very important. I think showing because I make mistakes, you make mistakes. It, it's not perfect. It's life, but sh- trying and caring is is the main thing. You're right. It's it's those actions it, you know that makes the big difference. That's a huge point you just made. Now I know yeah. mine remember all of my mistakes, so I will hundred percent, hundred percent. But as long as they know you cared and you tried. That's all that matters. That's what I was getting at. Exactly. Yeah. One of our running jokes is that oh, we, uh, 
we've, you know, I, I recommended one night, this is about five years ago, we were looking for something to watch on TV, and I thought, oh, there's this funny John Candy movie, you know, it, and Dan Aykroyd, some, um, The Great Outdoors. I don't know if you remember that movie. Yeah, I remember yeah. it as being fun. I like John Candy. I like John Candy. Well, yeah. don't show your boys because we got through about 30 minutes of it and they consistently bring it up as it, I can never recommend a movie again because you're done. You're done after that. Yeah. yeah. That's it. That's it. The great outdoors. Yeah. It does not stand the test of time. I will, I yeah. will tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. So when did you, so you, you clearly improved from your, um, your audition and I, I would love to see that early tape if, if given the mm, opportunity. Mm. Yeah. Um, we'll so, see. So you were hired in West Virginia. When did you realize, hey, that I'm good at this? Um, I think in, well, I don't know. You know, I don't think, I, I still don't think to this day that I am great at the TV part of it, but I do, uh, I do think I'm good at the communication part of it. So, and I think maybe that helps me that people see that I'm not going to be the most polished guy on TV and the smoothest, smoothest guy, because I, I just don't think the whole TV aspect in it, but I think being in West Virginia, um, you know, just just getting some experience helps me. And then um, while I was in West Virginia, it was kind of someone else. My old, uh, the place I interned, which was Fox Philadelphia, um, I got a call and they saw some of my stuff in West Virginia. And they said, hey, we have somebody going on maternity leave. Can you fill in and do weekends here? So here I'm, uh, this is like, I feel like I'm back in college. So I, I'm living in West Virginia my wife and I, and they asked me working Monday through Friday, and they asked me in Philadelphia to work weekends, which is a huge opportunity, a huge opportunity. Yeah, that's getting called up to the big leagues, right? Yeah. So, and I'm not, but I, I'm, I'm locked into a contract where I am. So, but I asked my boss, and I said, which is probably stupid. I probably wouldn't do it as, it was crazy, but I asked him and he said, absolutely. He, Cause he, he, again, he was a good guy and he wanted good opportunity for me down the road if I wasn't going to stay in West Virginia. So, then I did a mix of, I would do my morning broadcast in West Virginia on Friday morning, and I would every every weekend for three months, I did a mix of driving and flying. It was mainly driving, and that was 10 hours. I would drive, I would leave at like nine in the morning, I would get there at, maybe it's less than 10, someone could Google map it, but um, I would get there in the evening and then Friday night, I would be on TV in Philadelphia. So I would do Friday night, Saturday night there. Sunday, I would drive back. So I worked every day for three months for that opportunity, but which may sound crazy, but oddly enough, when I got to, when I interviewed in, so that went great. That was great. I had a great experience in Philadelphia. By the way, that, I just want to interrupt you for a second to say, that's not an insignificant thing, what you did, the level of commitment that you displayed in that it's it, that's meaningful in a, in a, in a very big way you, for three months straight, you worked every day. You left. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was to do so right. Every weekend. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, um, it was, it was a lot, but I, I had good support, but I, I loved what I did. How old were you when you, um, then I would be 22 to 24. So I would say about 23 ish, 24, 23, maybe. Okay. I came to Orlando when I was 24, 25 ish. Um, so, but I think that work ethic helped me move up quicker. And then in West Virginia, I got a call. It was the day of my um, rehearsal dinner. Um, so she was my fiance at the time, my rehearsal dinner uh, from a boss down in Orlando. And um, he wanted me to come down for an interview. So the day before I get married, I get a phone call that we may be going to Orlando. Go down to Orlando. I do the interview. Interview was fine. They had a lot of candidates. And I already knew because small industry, I already knew I was not even close to the first choice. They, were, they wanted these people that I were people I knew, some I considered mentors that actually turned down the job. So I was coming in like, again, we're not sure what this young guy could do, but at the end of my interview, I'm sitting there across from, a, you know, my boss, future boss's desk and he gets a phone call and he's like, hang on. I said, okay. So I'm sitting there for like a solid five minutes, which felt like five hours. And then he spins back around in his chair and he's still on the phone and he looks at, he looks at me and he goes, he's on the phone and he's looking at me and he goes, he goes, he's sitting right in front of me. And I'm like, what? I, he goes, he goes, okay. He, and then he's, and I hear him saying my name. So it's a random phone call comes in and he's saying my name. 
Well, it turns out that my former boss in West Virginia, because he left at the time, uh, was good friends with this guy. He had no idea I was there for the interview by by sheer luck, by God, whatever. He may, he called just to connect with his friend. No way. And okay. and because he told him, so my old boss in West Virginia told him what I did going to Philadelphia, what, driving 10 hours. Um, he hung up the phone and goes, you're hired. And that was the end of it. That was- Wow, no kidding. Was, oh, that, goes, I love he it. Goes, if, Terry Cole was his name. And he goes, if, if Terry- he goes, if you're good enough for Terry and you do that, he goes, you are good enough for me. It, it was a done deal. So before I even got back on the plane, that, that was, that was it. So, and then that made me feel like, okay, all the, all the hard work. I mean, that right there, that was, that was everything. So that was, I love it. I mean, that is such a great story and such a, um, you know, it's a testament to uh, your, the work ethic you put in and the commitment that you had to, you know, which out without knowing where it would lead. Right. I mean, I, I, no I idea. Yeah. At the time you were like, I don't, I, this just seems like the, the you know opportunity is knocking. I have to take yep, advantage exactly. of it. And I, again, I, I don't want to, won't continue to go back to it, but it's not insignificant what you did. It's, it's a big deal that you, for three months, that's a long time. It was uh, <laughs> a really long time was, to work around the clock. I loved it. There was some adrenaline because you're in this major Philadelphia you know, market, which was my dream market at the time. So I went to college and, you know, I had, a, you know, a lot of friends there. So there was some adrenaline over the first month and then it, then it got wearing pretty quickly because it was tiring. The travel, that travel was rough because, you know, I'd be up at three in the morning on Friday morning and then have to still travel by, by connecting through Cleveland or driving whatever amount of hours and then be on TV and, you know, energetic at 10 o'clock at night in Philadelphia on Friday night. So that got, a, and then the, the stress of that though is like, I, I didn't want to let them down. They were all good people on both ends. So, you know, if I missed my flight or something or something happened, I didn't miss my flight, but you know, if something happened, they would understand. But I knew if, you know, if I didn't get there in time or if I didn't, you know, if something happened with my flight, there's going to be a little cascade of events that weekend where someone would have to get called in. And, you know, you know, I kind of felt bad in hindsight, I shouldn't have felt bad. That's just part of the process, but it was, it was a little stressful, but it was great. It was good. But you know, it's it is so consistent though with um with how success happens. And and it's something that I've almost become obsessed with um recently is as you know, spending so much time creating this website that I want um to be you know the the most comprehensive site that exists on the internet to provide career advice and guidance. And and everyone wants to be successful. Success means something different, you know, from person to person. It doesn't mean you know necessarily financial or titles. Um but and if you're going to succeed in anything, you have to put in the time and effort. And yeah, you know, what's the Jerry Rice quote? Like, I'll do today what what others won't. So tomorrow I'll do what others can't. Or 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 Kobe Bryant. Yeah. I'm, you're a basketball guy, so you know all of, I'm sure about Kobe's early quotes and and saying, mm-hmm. I'm going to. No one is going to keep up with me because they're not going to do what I'm willing to do. Exactly. <laughs> and you, and you, were yeah. Yeah. you didn't have to, it was a hard choice, right? It wasn't the easy route. It was mm-hmm. a hard one. And you said, this is the right one. Mm-hmm. It's really impressive. I mean, did, did I, I do want to know though, as you're talking about the interview, how much of, of, you know, getting, um, you know, the job, um, to be on air is your on air presence versus your, um, your, your knowledge as a meteorologist. What's the mix? It's, what's important it's, that's a that's a great question because it's it's uh my my boss at the time who hired me in orlando he he knew i went to villanova he likes you know he wanted uh which is a villanova is a good school um and he he wanted smart people that work for him i think he is the only one of my bosses that ever has looked at a paper resume of mine like it's all about uh, you know, the TV side, I mean, they want, you know, they're doing all their Google searches now to see if your name pops up in weird places. They're checking your social media before they hire you, the, you know, all, all that stuff. They're, sure. they're trying to find out about you from, from other people. So you have to, they want you to be a good person, but nobody's asking, or at the time, even, you know, now we're older, so it doesn't matter anyway, but nobody at the time was, was checking my transcript to see if I had good grades. You know, that didn't, that didn't matter. It was really all in the, um, maybe it was 50, it was more than 50, you know, 80% of it was what you could do in the box of TV. And then the other 20%, 
are you a good person? Do I want to hire you? So, um, yeah, that's what it is. And is that, that's still else the case today? For, for and uh, still the case probably. Yeah, I mean, sure, it, differ, it differs on bosses. Um, I love my bosses right now, and they um, they really try to get good, you know, good people. So it's probably 50-50. You know, they want to, you know, really – really good person, good worker, someone who really cares about the community. Um, and you know, maybe that's, that's, maybe that's a shift. I don't know if it's a shift in everyone's industry, but just because of the dynamics, they want somebody who is, they're looking for authentic, you know, real people who uh, want to be part of, part of a team. So in, in my boss, I know my bosses are my bosses. They could fire me, you know, they're not my, you know, friends, but we have a relationship, you know, it's, sure. and they, 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 in, they are we're part of a team and it's okay. I like my bosses, but I, I know they can fire me, but um, it's, they want people that can work well on the team. So how, how much of um, your life when you're not on air comes into play Not you know, in your profession, not, not you personally, mm -hmm. but that has to be a factor, right? Where you are recognized um, in public. How conscious of that do you have to be in your daily life? Um, it's, I think, you know, I think my wife asked me this, not that same question, not too long ago in kind of a different wording. Um, you have to be, you do, you're thinking about it all the time, but I think I, I don't think about it now since I've been doing it since college. So it's almost second nature for me. So that's, I think that's why she asked me. She's kind of curious what I thought, like, am I constantly thinking about what I am doing out in public? Um, so I, it's just kind of ingrained in me now, but yeah, that is, it is a factor. You can't, I mean, you, you shouldn't be out there being a jerk anyway. Um, you know, that, that, that's the thing, but, um, yeah, I mean, I do, I do have to think about it. I have to think about what I post on social media. Um, that's all a factor. Behavior is a problem, but I mean, you're a good guy. I'm a good guy. And it's not, you know, I'm, you know, I, I, I shouldn't be getting arrested anytime soon. I want to jinx that. Um, but yeah, it's something, it's something I think about when, when we're at a restaurant, I've been at a restaurant before where I'm at a, I'm at a, we're in a booth and I'm here and, you know, my wife would be here. And then the, the person at the booth behind us is talking to me the whole time, the whole time. And it's, um, and she has to probably be aware of it even more because she, she has to be so patient. My kids are great, but, you know, getting stopped in publics so when we're trying to get somewhere quickly, you know, it's, it could take some time talking to people, but I'm happy to do it. And I, I've told them, I'm like, you know, if somebody comes up to me and then starts talking to me, I was like, maybe that's where we're supposed to be at the time. You know, maybe they need to have a good conversation and that's what we're, that's what we're going to do. So does that, um, yeah, I would think as someone who's not you know, famous and recognized that that would be, it would be really fun. It would be a great feeling to be recognized. I, you know, I tell my kids, this is, this is a little bit off topic maybe, but I think it still applies when I want them to be outgoing and friendly to everyone, you know, say mm -hmm. hi to people, let them know, you know, who they are because everyone feels good about that. And you know, as these boys are going into high school there, yeah, they can be um, self-conscious of those things. And I say, yeah. there's no bad scenario uh, and I've actually said this to all of mine at, at one time or another, where you get acknowledged by another person and you think less of them. You're always, it's always because it boosts your spirit to go, wow, they mm -hmm. remembered my name. What a cool thing. Now, as someone who is, is, you know, has fame to, to a degree, is that always the case or does it get old or, or does, or are there times where you're like, man, just leave me alone. Are there times where I'm like, alone I, I probably um no yeah i mean yesterday i was i was out with my son and my voice was not good and um and i knew and i grabbed him like we got we got to go because i didn't want to i didn't i wasn't talking to anyone at the time but i didn't want to run into anyone because i didn't want to um use my voice too much so that that's just a weird reason you know, occurrence where but it's not conscious of, for you. I mean, it I, could, I took, I took myself out of position because I knew I would get stopped. Um, so I, I, I made sure we were, you know, so yeah, I guess, I guess so. I guess it is something I think about, but most of that, I love it. I love talking to people. So it's, it's great. You know, I get good stories and maybe it's an advantage of living where we live. I, I don't know. We have a good, you know, we got a mix of people around here and natives, people from all over different countries, different States that are here in central Florida, I feel like people, um, I think it's good. I, I'm, I'm, I don't consider myself a celebrity, but like I look at the, uh, the athletes here, I think a lot of athletes like to have homes here because 
I don't think a ton of people really, you know, bother them. You know, it, it's cool to see, see one, but it's kind of, hey, how are you? And then you go on your way. We're all part of the community. So I think overall, we're in a great place to live. So most people are just awesome. So it's, it's easy. I mean, unless you're someone uh, who lives, you know, if you live here, unless you're just head in the sand, you, you, I think you, the vast, vast majority of people would recognize you. I don't know if, yeah, just, just your, your, from being on, on, on TV so much, on commercials and the whole thing. But I, I was just think of a story. I went to Boston last weekend and my neighbor across the street who was keeping the dogs uh, was there recently and said, hey, um, I, I ran into Ben Affleck on the tee in Boston the last time I was there. And he looked scruffy, but he was with this beautiful uh, girl and, and some older people. It turns out they, because I guess there's an app where you can track celebrities who I didn't know existed. Oh, goodness gracious. But, but he, he looked it up and said, yeah, it's Ben Affleck. But he said, I didn't realize, I didn't look it up until we got off. But they were the only ones on this car, uh, train car, and they were looking at each other. And it got, it, it was almost, he was describing it as if Ben Affleck was waiting for him to come over. And yeah. I thought, man, that would, if that were me, I would have said, yes, it's me. <laughs> yes, it's yeah, yeah, just, just say, yeah, just, yeah, exactly. But, so. but, but I, I was, that story was just a, from a couple of days ago. And no, when I was coming on with you, I was, I was thinking, do you get that a lot where people look at you we and get you look. know what it's, they're it's, thinking? It's the look all the time. And my wife will <laughs> point it out too. So it'll be, especially at a restaurant where somebody's not necessarily going to stand up and come over and talk to you. I will know immediately if somebody recognizes me. Like I will, I could tell that they're they're watching me, or that glance was too long, or they're, <laughs> you know, or, or 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 something like that. So yeah, I do know when somebody, you know, kind of kind of uh, recognizes you. So it's, it's that has there. to be hard it's the because but I get recognized a lot. I mean, my voice right now is a mess, but I get recognized a lot by my voice, and I don't I don't quite understand that because I mean I it's it's my own voice, so I don't understand, but. I've been told I have a, um, you know, a voice that kind of stands out. Uh, so I will be standing somewhere and someone behind me will be like, hear me talk. And we'll be like, Brian, and oh, then no they're way. like your voice. I knew, I knew it was you because you're a voice or I'll be in Seven Eleven or something like that, you know, where I'm wearing just t-shirt or whatever. And they're like, I recognize you because you're a voice. So it's a lot of, it's, it's, I think a lot of people will look at me and then they wait for me to talk and then, then they'll, they might say something. That's great. I love it. Um, so how long have you been in Orlando now? 2006. So what's the math there? 14, 15, 16 years or so? 16 years? Yeah. So what's yeah. The, oh, uh, 16 years a couple days ago. Yeah. 16 okay. Years. That's, a, that's a long run. That's a long yeah. run. Um, I, well, I do want to know, uh, in, is anyone who's thinking about becoming a meteorologist, just a couple questions about that. You mentioned that it, I, I assume um, I was not, I was a poli sci major, so I was not mm -hmm. the most um, serious student, I'll just say. Not, not that there's anything wrong with the major. Many well, you've done okay, so, you know. Well, well I, I, you know, when you're a poli sci major, you graduate, you're, you're, to, you're qualified to do one of two things. Well, one of three. Go to grad school, I guess. To get, right. but, but, you know, work in politics, maybe. I'm not even sure it qualifies you for that. Or go into sales. So, of course, you know, I ended up going into sales. But... Um, I, I'm assuming that to become a meteorologist, you know, the school is the you know, aspect of it is a challenge, right? I mean, it's yeah. gotta be, you gotta be a really good student, you know, good in science, needless to say, right? Yeah. So yeah. how hard is it to get a job is, I mean, it's been quite a while for you, but do you uh, keeping up with the market where most, there are more jobs than, than people right now. And there have been pre COVID COVID made it worse. Yeah. The baby boomer generation is retiring. So there, that's going to be a problem, uh, in my professional opinion, as a staffing person for the rest of our career and, and into our kids' generation. Um, you know, there's some funky stuff going on with the economy right now, but put that aside, there are yeah. more jobs than people. How is that in, the, in your space? Yeah, and it's, um, there's a lot of jobs because weather has expanded so greatly. And there was a little shift. Um, can't remember, maybe a decade ago, it went away from, maybe it's more than that, maybe 10, 15 years ago, uh, the TV side of it, they're like, okay, maybe we don't need true meteorologists. Maybe we could just find some really good TV people that, you know, we could just teach them a little bit of weather and they can, they can do it. So they weren't necessarily scientists, which is, which is fine. Um, I, I don't care as long as they're communicating the right stuff to keep people safe. That's my bottom line. But then it's kind of shifted back. Weather, climate, all that has become so big that now there's a shift back to 
you know, for the weather jobs, they want somebody very, very scientific and, you know, deep into the meteorology. Fortunately, there's a lot more schools out there that have it now, but it can be, um, it's tough. It's tough. Um, the schooling is tough. So, so there's a lot of jobs, uh, but to get through the schooling is tough. And there's a lot of math and there's a lot of math you don't ever need after, after you're done. It's kind of one of those. Fortunately, uh, certain schools have shifted away. Uh, Mississippi State, where I have uh, one of my degrees from, they have a they have a degree that's tailored more to broadcast meteorology because, frankly, I don't. My math is the math I use is it was ninety five yesterday, it's ninety today. We're five degrees cooler. That's like the math I do, <laughs> you know. And I don't need to go to some you know school and do you know a bazillion hours of calculus other than to impress other meteorologists. So. Fortunately, certain programs have shifted away and have realized the communication piece is uh, so big. But yeah, there's a ton of jobs and um, the schooling is tough. It's tough. Yeah, I, no, no doubt. Um, degrees, you need an advanced degree or is it, can you, can you get on TV with, with just a bachelor's? You could get on TV with whatever they will let you on TV with. Okay. So, I mean, that is... The bottom line, if they like you, if they feel whatever, you know, they could get you on. But you know, with meteorology, um, you know, you could get a you could get a bachelor's degree and you're you're good. I have I have a couple bachelor's degrees um, and then I did some extra schooling after. So um, it depends. But as far as they want, I am a certified broadcast meteorologist. So therefore, I had to take X amount of classes. You know, that's that's kind of a different criteria. So there's different kind of levels depending on what. A TV station wants. They want us all certified. All my whole team is there. It's a group of certified meteorologists. Okay, nice. So that's great information. Um, I do uh, want to know, from, since this is something you look thought about doing for a long time as a kid, what has surprised you? What's what's you know something that you would know as an insider that those of us who who um, who don't really have that kind of knowledge about what a day, you know, your life is like as a meteorologist, especially one on, on TV. What, uh, what's different than what you would have expected it to be? Um, what's different? Let's see. Wow. That's a great question. That is a good question. I needed some prep on that. Question. Yo, Brian, I am a professional oh. interviewer <laughs> after, uh, <laughs> after, <laughs> that, after, that is after true. Um, podcast episodes. What is, what is different? I think uh, there's some perception things that I think are different. It's funny. Like, Sometimes I'll come across uh, the TV ratings. Um, that's not something that's very public. We, every day I get an email that I know exactly how we did the day before. Mm. So, you know, I could see, you know, someone from my competition maybe putting something out on social media like, hey, we're the best. Everyone's watching us. I'm like, I got the ratings here and that's not the case. Like, you know, so there's, there's inside stuff that, you know, everyone doesn't see or, you know, occasionally run across someone who would be like, well, you know, it seems like everyone's watching this station and I'm just like, no, no, that's not, you know, this, you know, so there's, there's inside analytics, you know, like any, any job has that, but it's interesting that we have the, the, the public um, dynamic um, that may not know all of it. Um, I think you run across most of the people I work with are just great people. I've been fortunate to work that way. I have run into some people in other places that, you know, they have one personality on TV and one personality off TV. Um, and while you have to do different things when you're on TV, like, you know, project your voice and, you know, be a certain way, you know, it's, it's, that's probably not a good thing. You should be, you know, being authentic. So there are a couple, you know, a few people you come across that kind of seem to have different personalities on camera versus off camera. So and you know who they are. I know who they are, not any names. No, so, I wouldn't yeah. ask you to, <laughs> ask you to do that. The two things I would like, that's what, that's the second thing I would love to know uh, that I won't ask you for. You wouldn't tell me anyway. The other thing, and I also won't ask you, at least not on air, I will ask you privately. It's up to you whether you share with me is, um, you know, your opinion on, on you, know, the, you know, the climate and what's changing there and global warming mm -hmm. and all of those. Do you get asked that a lot? All the time. And in my, it's terrible because my, answer is not super popular probably with with my colleagues because my colleagues there has been a big shift to climate and climate studies which is awesome great go for it but i'm just i think it's my old school way of thinking i'm a meteorologist not a climatologist right i think a lot of my colleagues hammer ha would hammer me on that point they're like well you still got to know about this if you're not taking up 
you know, this cause, then, you know, you're not doing your job, but I've got enough to do with being meteorologists with hurricanes and stuff and trying to properly communicate that. And, and, you know, so I, in, in one of my professors was more of a climatologist back in the day. So I think I just have this built in respect for people that do other things. And I'm not looking to jump in just because I'm a scientist in one field. I'm not a scientist everywhere. So frankly, I don't study that. So I don't know. Sure, I see everything that's out there, and you know, you could call you call me lazy or call me whatever. But I'm busy studying meteorology. I see the other stuff, but I also know what you know true climatologists do, and they are deep into stuff. And I would just defer to them. That's not. It's not what I do. It's not what I do. Man, I, I that is such a great answer because it's in con- stark stark contrast to what we see today where, you know, suddenly everyone's a, an economist and, you know, um, any, anything that happens and You're right, anything you know, that happens, policy yeah. that happens, right. We're suddenly experts. We could go down the list of all the things, yes, you know, yes, bi- yes, biology, yes. <laughs> right yes, yes. everything, everything. Apparently no everything. one's an expert in biology. That's a different one, but, but you know, the, that's a, I, what a great answer. I, I, I'm, I'm glad that came up. I wasn't going to ask you about it, you know, because I didn't want to put you on the spot with that. But, um, I'm glad I did uh, bring it up because we need more of that, right? We need more people willing to defer and say, this is, there, there's someone who's more qualified than me, even though I don't, I don't know enough about very it. qualified to yeah. answer. I think uh, people see that though. When I say that, they see that as an out, you know, I'm just trying to avoid the, but I, I, one of my professors was a client. I see what climatologists, you know, the true ones do. I am not that I'm not that. So I don't, I can't pretend to be one, so I would defer to them. So, yeah. Oh man, I, I think that's that's a, such an awesome answer. Well, Brian, thank you so much. I I I, um, I could talk to you all day. Um, it, in the well, I do want to say before I let you go that it, it, it's no surprise to me that when you mention the ratings of something that you pay attention to, because you and I met because we both were coaching basketball um, with our sons, and I will just go on record and say that you um, you got the best of me. I think. Probably we every both time. Had, uh, <laughs> we both did excellent. Our, you know, we our players did nothing. They would be nothing without us. And we're both awesome coaches. That's, that's the bottom line. Right right there. That's the bottom line. So. Yeah, your players were awful, and and you just yeah. you know led. Them to, they were. are all lucky to have us. We're lucky to have us. No, but um, you know, you know, you being the competitor that I knew you to be in that regard, um, it's it's. It was, as I'm talking to you, I learned a lot about your background today that I did not know and seeing what you were willing to do professionally for your career and the sacrifices you were willing to make, um, I think is a great story and no surprise. I didn't know what the story would be, but knowing that um, what you did is exactly the kind of thing I would have expected from knowing who you are and what you've achieved. So thank you very much for sharing that today. No, thank you for having me. I really appreciate that. I've been listening to some of your podcasts and they're excellent. So I hope, thank you for doing it. I think it's a huge help um, to any, frankly, anyone, no matter what they're doing. So it, it's awesome. Wonderful. Well, everyone, thank you for listening. Brian, one more time. Thank you so much. And I uh, look forward to seeing you on, on the basketball court soon. So thank Sue, you. definitely. Thank you. <laughs>